CRJ 225, this is the podcast for weeks number 13 and 14 where we look at offenses against the administration of justice. This is a review from some of the discussion in weeks 11 and 12. We're going to have a little bit of a more dedicated focus here. It does include some additional things. Um, One of those things is compounding a crime. Compounding a crime is an offense committed by a victim of a crime. It occurs when the victim agrees not to cooperate in the prosecution of a crime or suppress the evidence of a crime in exchange for money or some form of compensation, Um, often referred to in the statutes as consideration. But think compensation. They're they're paid. they're, They're given some benefit. It's a crime punishable by imprisonment or fine. It's uh, a petty offense in Illinois. And I put the statute in the reading materials, But so go and and read the statute. You won't need to look that one up. The next one we're going to review, we've we've talked a little bit about perjury and subornation of perjury. And um, Perjury, as you know now, is lying while under oath. It can be construed as an obstruction of justice, and because of this, it is taken seriously by Illinois and in the federal courts. You can be charged with perjury while you are navigating the court system because of another criminal charge or when you are involved in the civil case. Any instance of intentionally lying while under oath can be charged as an act of perjury. This goes beyond testimonies given during criminal trials and includes statements made in family court, during bail hearings, during depositions, during grand jury. So think any time a person is thought to be under oath. Surprisingly, not all intentional lies rise to be perjury. For a statement to be deemed an act of perjury, its content must be material to the legal proceeding at hand. In other words, lies are not acts of perjury if they are irrelevant to a particular case or investigation. Additionally, the statement must meet the following criteria to be deemed an act of perjury. One, it must be made while under oath. Two, it can be a written or spoken statement. Um, Students who have had my, or are in my civil litigation course, uh, know this because when we do written discovery in civil cases, those responses are sworn. They come with a signed statement notarized that the information is accurate. Silence is not an act of perjury. Um, It must have been made with the intent to mislead. And false statements due to confusion or memory errors are not instances of perjury. In Illinois, perjury is a Class 3 felony. Additionally, A lawyer or other professional can have their license suspended. Police officers can lose their certifications to serve. Perjury, you may remember, is considered a crime of moral turpitude. Now, some defenses to perjury. um, Demonstrating that your false statement was not made intentionally, but due to confusion, misunderstanding, or misremembering an event or demonstrating that your erroneous statement was not material to the proceeding. In other words, you must show that although you did make a false statement, it ultimately could not have influenced the case's outcome. Kind of, you lied, but so what? I link the statutes, or put the statutes in the materials, so read the statutes on both subordination and perjury. It's going to be relevant to your week 13 assignment where you're going to focus on perjury by a police officer. Next, I want to talk about interfering with a witness or a jury.
as you can imagine, it's extremely important to the day-to-day functions of our criminal justice system that no interference occurs with witnesses who may be called to testify in a court proceeding or jurors who may be called to serve as the trier of fact in a case. For this reason, Illinois has several offenses intended to address this type of obstruction. Even communicating with jurors or witnesses could be considered a crime. Uh, the paralegal students know that it's an ethical violation for lawyers or people working for lawyers to communicate with jurors during the case. Even though you're the trial lawyer in the case, if you happen to be in the hallway and the juror talks to you, you have to go tell the judge the juror talked to you. And you definitely should not initiate any contact with the jurors during a case, other than when they're in the jury box and you're performing your duties as a lawyer in the case at the direction of the trial judge. The first offense um, we'll look at is this offense of contacting a juror or witness with the intent to influence their behavior in a court of law. Depending on the nature of the offense, a violation here qualifies as a Class 3 or Class 4 felony. Likewise, it's also a crime to harass a juror or witness or their family members. Family members being defined as spouse, parent, child, or stepchild. So real immediate, right? Harassment could lead to a conviction that could be classified as a misdemeanor, or in some cases, it is a felony. Finally, we've talked about bribery. And when bribery occurs related to witnesses or juries, it truly creates a breach of trust in our system of justice. Illinois statutes prohibit bribery of several groups of people. And having looked at bribery prior to this week, you know um, you know who we're talking about. In particular to this setting, it's illegal for a jury commissioner or someone who provides a court with a list of available jurors to excuse a certain individual from jury duty in exchange for a bribe. So don't go and try to bribe the jury commissioner because you don't want to serve on a jury. Go and take your time and do your, do your duty like the rest of us. It's also unlawful for a juror or witness to accept any consideration of any type from a party prior to a judgment or verdict. And these crimes qualify as either Class A or Class B misdemeanor. Finally, and this should be obvious, it is illegal to bribe a judge in order to procure a favorable verdict. And this would be a Class 2 felony. And I also linked the statute or listed the statute in the materials for these offenses. Read the entire statute. Um, The last thing I'll say on this jury uh, section, and it's something that you probably all should keep or be aware of, if you've never been called to serve on a jury, uh, if you do get called, you will have to go. You won't be excused um, initially, although the likelihood that you would be allowed to serve on a jury if you are in any way associated with the justice system as either a a lawyer, a paralegal, a police officer, investigator, probation officer, whatever it is you might be, is pretty low. Um, But at my age, I have been called to serve on a jury Um, I don't know, I think four or five times since, uh, since I got out of college or since I, you know, turned 21, I did serve on a jury prior to that time. 
Um, so when I was a student at Bradley, and uh, it was an interesting experience, I'll tell you that. I've argued cases before many juries. Um, and then one time after I um, had been a cop, been a lawyer for many years, um, I got called to jury duty. I was taken to a courtroom with other prospective jurors, put in the jury box, and I expected um, that I would be excused as I had been and every other time. This time, um, my friend, retired judge uh, Mike Brandt, was sitting on the bench hearing the case. Uh, Mike was teaching for us at the time. He knew that I was in the middle of final exams and had a whole lot of grading and work to do. Um, it was a criminal case. It was a felony. It was a home invasion and rape. And by the time they got to me, I was sitting in the alternate seat. So they had picked their 12 jurors. And it had been a long day. And they were tired. And... Judge Brandt looked at the prosecutor, who I knew very well, and the defense lawyer, who I knew very well, and without having any questions of me, just said, any problem with Tom serving as the alternate? <laughs> and, uh, nope. And there I was. So, uh, I did have an opportunity since all that, and my experience and career to sit there. Now, what happened there was I sat through the entire case and I was ready to help come to the, uh, the verdict in the case. But as an alternate, when you get to that point, when the case is ready to go to the jury, if there is no need for the alternate, if all 12 initial jurors are still present and able to serve, the alternates excused. So they took the jury back to the jury room um, and after hearing all the instructions and so forth and gave them the case and then I was able to go home but I went up to the bench and asked Mike what would you do that for? You know why did you keep me? I had to sit there for three days listen to this case. It was very interesting but I had a lot of other work to do. Um, and he said, well, I thought you needed the perspective, a refresher. And it actually was. And that goes back to a point that I made earlier in the semester. The courts are open to you. Even with all of our restrictions of recent, the recent past few years, um, and that may ebb and flow, you can go sit through criminal cases. If you go to court scheduling or you find a bailiff or court security and you tell them you are a student and Professor Higgins is criminal law or criminal evidence or administration of justice or whatever course or any course here at ICC and your professor said that it would be a good idea for you to view or watch some of a trial, go do that. You'll get two major benefits. One, you'll learn pretty quickly that it's nothing like television. No dun-dun, there's no drama, there's no um, you know, theatrics for the most part. But you'll also get to see, hopefully, police officers testify. Sometimes defendants testify. You get to see witnesses testify. You get to see lawyers argue, and you'll get to see how they piece together or tie together the evidence um, or try to refute that evidence as it goes to the elements of the types of offenses we've discussed in the past 14 weeks. So if you get a chance, go do that. If you need anything regarding this content or the end of the semester um, or career advice,
advice or whatever, whatever you need, reach out. You know where to find me. Otherwise, listen to this for week 13. Come back and listen to it again for week 14. And pay attention to the assignments. Week 13 has a very specific focus. And week 14 um, does as well. A little different in focus and what I'm asking of you than we had in prior weeks. Not that difficult and it should be easy for you to do. But I'm really looking for your thoughts as to how these things impact you. Assuming that you're going to continue on this career path and work in the system. Stay well.